Hey everyone, welcome back to AgriTechture's Travel Free webinar series. Today I am welcoming Zach Olson from Black and Veatch. Zach is the director of Next Gen Ag Business and excited to have him on the webcast and to learn more about what they're doing. How are you doing, Zach? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, all good, all things considered. Um, but fortunate enough to to have these types of technologies to get these stories out there and to share more with our audience. So excited to share more about what you're doing with our audience. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, awesome. I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here and share with your audience as well. It's uh, it's really cool in my mind that uh, you guys are, are taking the the uh, optimistic approach and the opportunity here to um, uh, to share some knowledge while we're all in kind of this crazy situation going on in the world. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I work for Black and Veatch, and um, for a lot of people who don't know, uh, Black and Veatch is a uh, engineering and construction company. Um, we offer really a wide uh, array of services across um, project life cycles, all the way from uh, project planning and permitting and project development on through detailed design engineering and construction um, across a wide variety of industries. So um, we're a hundred year old company based in uh, Midwest uh, in Kansas City actually. And um, traditionally, we've been working in uh, in industries that would be considered infrastructure. So think water, uh, power, oil and gas, uh, telecommunications, things of that nature. Um, But we also do work in the industrial and manufacturing space, the food and agriculture space, mining, um, and some of those other kind of um, industries. So um, really, the point there is we're a large company. We work across a diverse set of markets. and um, we work across the globe too. So uh, globally, we have about 11,000 people, you know, roughly coming up on $4 billion in revenue. Um, and we've worked in over 100 countries. So, um, you know, really we're, we're quite global. We take a global view of the types of challenges that we're trying to solve for our clients. So then going um, specifically to what is Next Gen Ag uh, at Black and Beach Mean, and that's the business that, that I'm responsible for at the company. Um, and so to us, it's really a focus on where is the future uh, and what is the future of, the, of you know, uh, infrastructure business that we can really impact. And so we, uh, a few years ago, really started focusing on technology providers in the food and agriculture space that are bringing novel technologies um, to the fore in order to you know impact the food system. So we've kind of you know segmented, if you will, the um, areas of interest for our team. Um, being an engineering uh, and construction focused team, we're looking at technologies that, that are going to need those skill sets. You won't see a lot of you know regenerative ag, broad acre drones and things like that. Um, it's interesting technology in the agriculture space. It's just not what we're focused on. So. You know, like I said, we've segmented it into controlled environment agriculture, aquaculture and aquafeed, alternative proteins, and then sustainable agriculture solutions, which is maybe a little bit amorphous, but um, is really about enhancing sustainability through um, you know, existing agriculture practices, maybe things like resource management, uh, manure management, uh, and valorization um, but really today, I want to focus on you know, what we kind of consider controlled environment agriculture. And I think um, you know, a lot of people think you know, CEA, they think vertical farming, maybe advanced greenhouses. Um, but I kind of like to take maybe a more expansive vi- version or vision of what controlled environment agriculture really means. Um, and so I, I think of it as anytime you're engineering the envi- an, an environment to optimize this biological process that's occurring within that environment. So that obviously includes vertical farming and advanced greenhouses. Um, but we've also um, worked with companies working on things like recirculating aquaculture, which is obviously um, in highly controlled environments for raising fish. Uh, we're working with companies that are looking at algae photobioreactors to control algae growth. Um, mycelium or you know mushroom based technologies uh, we're working on fermentation and cell culture applications 
uh, as well as controlled environment applications that um, deal with insects. So, you know, again, thinking of it as um, this more wide ranging uh, ability to control environments and promote the specific biology or the specific biological pathway that you're looking to get um, that food product. So one of the ways that we really help uh, companies in this space is thinking about um, how to scale a specific technology. So, you know, we take the view that technology is really critically important, um, but the impact that these technologies will have come from their ability to scale, scale economically and scale quickly. Um, and so we view as an engineering and construction company that the primary challenge that we can help solve is scale. Um, and that's where the true impact comes. I mean, if you look at the status quo in the agriculture, uh, food and agriculture industry, um, those supply chains have been built up over decades. The methodologies have been built up over decades. And there's been, you know, all this opportunity to optimize and to establish, um, you know, that status quo. So if a technology company is looking to disrupt that, you know, their technology is, is obviously important, but their ability to scale um, is, is just as important. And so, you know, I think of scale primarily in two different ways here. One is scaling up, and then the other would be scaling out. So, you know, first to talk about scale up challenges. And when I mean scale, or when I say scale up, what I mean is, you know, maybe we've developed a technology at a lab or a bench scale, um, and this would be, this is really the primary challenge of, let's, let's say, cell culture um, meat, which is, is kind of a hot topic in the ag tech uh, space. So, you know, if we've proven that we can get the fundamental science to work at a lab or a bench scale, um, we need to take that to pilot scale, then we need to take that to demonstration scale. And ultimately, um, we envision that there'll be the development of large kind of centralized production assets. Think, you know, um, in the context of, you know, traditional industries for Black and Beach, I think of, you know, chemical processing plants or power plants, you know, large assets that you gain economies of scale by centralizing that production. So, the challenges here really, in my view, are science to engineering transition, um, which essentially means is, this, is the science going to behave the same at every level of scale that you go? If you, if you 10x that size of that production system, what might break? And looking at that and, and engineering systems to um, get the right you know, oxygen transfer rates or to get the right um, heating and cooling parameters. Um, the other challenges that, that we see in this space that, that maybe are underestimated or undervalued uh, are around project development timelines and then closely related to that are project level investment. Um, it's obviously challenging to take a first of a kind or an unproven or unknown technology and solicit investment to build a facility that might cost tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So. Um, there's a lot of investor due diligence that goes along with that, um, and those timelines, are, you know, are years to get a project in the ground. So, um, you know, one of the things that, that we always recommend is starting early on thinking about that vision to scale, um, such that, you know, you don't achieve one hurdle and then have to stop and say, okay, now where do we go? It's, it's having this uh, progression or this planned progression um, that, you know, assesses the technology readiness. Are we truly ready from a technology standpoint to take that next leap? Um, do, is there a techno-economic model that makes this project feasible? I mean, again, you're going to be having to solicit project level investment and satisfy, um, you know, project equity investors who are not going to be necessarily as um, forgiving or risk tolerant as venture investors might be. So, the, the second challenge that I mentioned is the scale out challenges. And this, this challenge is, in the, again, in the traditional Black and Beach world, I would, I would go to the telecom industry. Um, you know, telecommunications industry, they don't build bigger and bigger and bigger cell towers. They just build more and more and more of them. Um, so scale out challenges, I think, are applicable to businesses that really have a technology that is you know, fairly well proven at the scale that it will be deployed at. And now your challenge is 
how do I deploy this as rapidly as possible or as cost efficiently as possible? So um, I'll actually mention one of the clients we're working with uh, in this space who we're, we're really helping on more on this scale out challenge side of things is a company called Agbotic. They, um, they have a organic greenhouse um, technology. They you know, got some really cool things around automation. Um, you know, and they're operating at the scale that they envision they would um, commercialize at. Um, so now the challenges come into play are, you know, cost optimization. How do we lower the cost of each individual project or each individual facility or piece of equipment that we're deploying? Um, you know, challenges are around repeatability. Um, can we get identical performance out of this asset on the hundredth time or the thousandth time? Um, an interesting challenge around logistics. Uh, you know, I think this is, again, another maybe undervalued um, challenge of if, you, if I have a hundred or a thousand assets out in the field, how do I make sure that they're all running optimally? Do I have, you know, um, shipping or trucking concerns? Um, tied into that is, you know, operations, maintenance, and training. Um, how do I find qualified operators? How do I make sure that the technology is being maintained adequately? And how do I train that many people if I'm going to have this, you know, really hyperbolic growth? Um, and so the last one here I'll also mention is global applicability. And, and what I mean here is, can we take that technology? And it's not a, a challenge that applies to every company, but can we take that, that technology that might work well in the U.S.? but is it viable in Europe? Is it viable in Africa? Or maybe we're designing a technology that is meant to work well in Africa, but does it scale in um, you know, Asia? So there's, there's all of these different challenges about how do we take uh, an asset that we really want to um, deploy as quickly and cost-effectively as possible and um, and make sure it's adapted for the widest variety of use cases possible. So, um, you know, I really, that, that leads me to a couple of pieces of advice, if you will, for technology companies, uh, based on our experience working with a lot of these kind of early stage companies um, and maybe some common mistakes that, that we have seen. So one I'd say is, is focus on the core expertise. Um, and what I mean here is I think that there are a lot of, a lot of times people get distracted by, you know, shiny objects syndrome or, um, you know, maybe sometimes it's pressure from investors, but um, really I think technology companies are best served when they're focusing on developing and refining their core technology. And then that leads into this idea of developing a network of trusted partners. Um, the partners really are, the people that help you achieve scale um, while you focus on what you're good at and where the partners focus on what they're good at. Um, so again, our pitch is, you know, when it comes to engineering and construction, um, you know, we have those skill sets in, inherently in-house. Um, we have people who've helped bridge this science to engineering gap. So, you know, we view ourselves as, as a uh, potential partner for those companies that are really looking to, to take that next step. Um, and then I'd say, you know, the other one is, and these are all really related, but it's build one business, quote unquote, at a time. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of companies who um, are trying to build a technology business. They might be trying to build a retail business. They might be trying to build an engineering and construction business or an EPC business in house. And it really spreads them thin. And so again, it goes back to what is your core business? What is, what are you, what is your core competency? and then um, rely on the market for everything else because I really do think that there are um, good partners out there in the market that can you know, allow companies with limited resources to dedicate those resources to what truly matters to their success. So I think that's really uh, about all I had as a prepared presentation, so happy to jump to some Q&A. Awesome, Zach, awesome. Well, um... A great presentation. I think there's a lot in there that you said that I um, I think I resonate with and I think our two companies share as we continue to, you know, see this industry expand. Um, I actually really was hoping that you can go back to your fifth slide because I think that's a great slide um, showing that, you know, CEA is, is way more than just vertical farming and leafy greens. Um, 
And I wanted to ask, you know, what do you think are the main challenges for each of those categories of of crops or products within the controlled environment? So it was vertical farming, it was aquaculture, mycelium. I mean, what are the main differences that you see in how do you see, you know, this, what are the similarities within the controlled environment and all these different sure. aspects? Yeah, and let me let me pull this slide back up since I'd already stopped the share so that we can actually uh, take a look at them. So yeah, I, I think maybe I'll first start with your question about what is the common um, the common element there. And I'd say, you know, really in all of these, there is a a very high focus on environmental controls. So I think it's well known in the the you know leafy green vertical farming space or even the cannabis space that um, temperature and humidity are, are really important, along with airflow and, um, and some others. But I think you'd see the same um, when it comes to, to all of these, right? Recirculating aquaculture. It's water temperature and water conditions, but it's, you know, those environmental controls are really, are really the key. And, and tuning into um, to where, um, where exactly that biology performs the best. Um, but then I, I would say not over engineering the system to be, you know, so expensive that, you know, you might be able to hold temperature exactly perfectly, but at what cost, right? So it's, it's optimizing a solution that is fit for purpose, that is engineered well enough to ensure that the biology performs. Um, but if we double the cost to get a 1% increase in performance, it's, it's likely not worth um, not likely not worth it. So I'd say that's the really the commonality in all of these. Now, each of them have their own challenges when it comes to, um, you know, heat rejection or, um, you know, heat sources are different. Um, so, you know, vertical farming, you have a lot of, uh, especially if you're in a controlled, like a enclosed environment, you have uh, LED lighting, things of that nature. Um, recirculating aquaculture, a lot of that is, you know, heat introduced from pumping, uh, as well as the, you know, metabolic energy of um, the organisms, or the fish in this case, um, you know, fermentation and cell culture. And, and this is, you know, um, something that we'll, we'll see the challenge present as companies scale. But, um, you know, to me here, the real challenge is when you understand the, um, the, heat production of heat rejection at uh, a lab scale uh, and then you go and put something in a 10,000 or 100,000 liter um, uh, reactor or vessel, uh, the characteristics are going to are going to change completely and how does that heat transfer work and how are we able to get heat from the center of a reactor to the edges so that we can reject it. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, you know, Again, each of them have a, a mm -hmm. bit of their own unique flavor of challenge, but um, environmental is the real key. And I think what's you know so fascinating about this industry is how it's pairing both engineering and horticulture plant science together. And you know sometimes it feels like you know there isn't exactly a program or a course or you know some learning platform where you can combine both together. And what we see usually is, you know, a lot of individuals are very excited about the industry, but either come from a, an engineering background or a plant science background. And I'm curious, you know, what do you think can be done to help improve the, the knowledge base, knowledge set for those that want to really, you know, pair these two um, studies together to, to further the industry? That's, that's a great question. Um, yeah, because I, I think I see the exact same thing um, that you're that you're hitting on, and 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 quite honestly, I would say we even um, say that we rely a lot on our partners or our, the comp our clients to bring a lot of the whether it's the plant biology knowledge or whether it's the fishery biology knowledge or really the knowledge of their um, their organism, um, and you know. To me, it's there's there's a bit of a disconnect, particularly on let's say like the leafy greens, and well, I see like a huge huge um, knowledge gap on the recirculating aquaculture side too. Um, if that were to you know really expand in the U.S., 
Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. We have, you know, there are universities that offer agricultural engineering degrees, but those are mostly focused on kind of this uh, broad acre, you know, commodity crop farming. Um, so, you know, I think it'd be, it'd be really, um, you know, it, it, to me, it almost has to start coming at the university system level. And I know that, that certain university systems um, have focused on aquaculture, particularly in the South, where there, there is some, you know, open pond aquaculture in the U.S. Um, you know, and when the leafy green side of things in the University of Arizona, Cornell, and some others have, you know, some controlled environment ag programs. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's an agricultural mm -hmm. engineering program that really focuses on um, both the biology side and the, um, the agriculture side. I'll say, I think there is a better model when it comes to, um, you know, the fermentation cell culture side of things. They're, you know, programs that have, you know, bioprocess engineering or biological engineering um, that maybe mostly go into today, the pharmaceutical market or, you know, research more on the medical and health side of things. Um, but I think that that model could really be applied to, to food. And we're starting to see some crossover there, I think. Got it. Got it. And I think, you know, one, one more question for you, Zach, and I think this is sure. going more towards, you know, what's happening uh, around the world, given, you know, this pandemic, there's a lot of conversation about, you know, what is the future of food and agricultural systems in the context of cities and more of a, a local and regional aspect when you see, you know, supply chains being affected, borders closing down and really transportation becoming a very, very problematic option to move product across the world. So what do you think is gonna happen within the CEA industry and the agricultural industry in, in response to this pandemic? And it's a pretty, pretty big question, yeah, I so. Mean, yeah, no, I mean, I, I can say, you know, I, 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 I'm hopeful that there um, will be, you know, additional focus put on, um, you know, how can we leverage these technologies and how can, you know, we like leverage government support or, um, you know, corporate support for uh, implementing some of these technologies that would address or have the opportunity or potential to address some of those, you know, supply chain issues and, and things that you mentioned. I mean, um, I'm going to maybe let's, let's hone in on, on aquaculture for a second because, um, you know, that, that to me is a big one. I, we get, Primarily, if you talk about Atlantic salmon in particular, I mean, it's Norway and Chile provide 95% of um, what we consume in the U.S. So there's, there's a really big opportunity to create a local industry, um, you know, leveraging uh, this technology. Um, you know, I think the same goes for, um, you know, moving production out of California when it comes to leafy greens and, and centralizing it closer to cities. I think, um, you know, I, I think there will be naturally some supply chains that are more challenging to, to move and that you certainly will still see some centralization of, of production um, just based on, you know, um, where it's most cost optimal to, to produce. Um, but I think that really, um, there's a, there's a great opportunity to, particularly when, it, when you look at, um, you know, the disruption of some of those international supply chains, mm -hmm. um, uh, take these technologies um, forward. I think the biggest challenge here is that these are new technologies and by nature there has not been the, the investment in um, cost optimization on, you know, um, a pound of fish or a pound of, um, you know, lettuce coming out of mm -hmm. these systems is still higher than, you know, the status quo. Mm -hmm. Well, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you're trying to disrupt decades of established supply chains. You're trying to disrupt, um, you know, maybe a politically powerful incumbent. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot at play already. So yeah, I'm hopeful that the, um, and, and I'm hopeful because I think I've seen a lot of, you know, optimism, already uh, that's coming out of the current pandemic situation on, you know, um, you know, people coming together and, and really, you know, focusing on, okay, how do we, um, 
how do we find a vaccine or, or testing, you know, we can, we have the capacity to, you know, enact and enable these rapid shifts. It just, it takes focused effort. And, um, you know, I think coming out of a situation like this, we can um, collectively look at the way food is produced and say, is this what we really want? Or can we, can we come up with something better? So. Yeah, well, uh, I'm right there with you. You know, I'm hopeful. I think time will tell how we, as an industry, as a society, you know, respond, change and adapt to, you know, our, our global environment. And, you know, I think with that, with that, um, Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Um, for our audience, if you have a question, feel free to throw it in the comments, give a like, a subscribe. And Zach Olson, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure.